On Tuesday, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony from the head of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration about the effectiveness of drug treatment programs. This is two and a half hours. Subcommittee will come to order. Good afternoon, and I thank you all for coming. Today we'll continue our subcommittee study of drug addiction treatment, or as President Bush refers to it in the National Drug Control Strategy, Healing America's Drug Users. It is estimated that at least 7 million people in the United States need treatment for drug addiction. Getting effective help to those 7 million people and getting them to accept that help is one of America's greatest public health challenges. Everyone agrees that we should help drug addicts get effective treatment. What is far more difficult is to find a consensus on how to measure what effective treatment is. But it is vital that we find that consensus because in an era of tight budgets, we must be able to focus our limited resources on the most effective treatment methods. Last year, President Bush took what I believe to be a very significant step in that direction when he unveiled the Access to Recovery Initiative. Beginning this fiscal year, the President's initiative will provide $100 million to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, to supplement existing treatment programs. That amount of money is intended to pay for drug treatment for most Americans who now want it but can't get it, many of whom can't afford the cost of treatment and don't have insurance that covers it. It fully funded at $200 million per year, if fully funded at $200 million per year, as requested by the President. It could help up to 100,000 more addicts get treatment. The program also has enormous potential to open up federal assistance to a much broader range of treatment providers than are used today. Through the use of vouchers, the initiative will support and encourage variety and choice in treatment and could open up and support a significant number of new options for drug users to get treatment. Finally, and most important for our purpose today, the emphasis on accountability should help us make significant progress in the most difficult issues of drug treatment policy, finding and encouraging programs that truly work to help and heal the addicted, as well as ensuring a meaningful and effective return on taxpayer dollars spent on treatment. Earlier this month, SAMHSA published a request for applications spelling out the qualifications for programs to administer the new funds and inviting those programs to apply. The RFA, the Request for Application, contains new performance measures designed to help us determine what programs are working for their patients and which ones aren't. I'm especially looking forward to discussing the Access to Recovery Initiative with the person most responsible for implementing it, my fellow Hoosier, SAMHSA Administrator Charlie Curry. With SAMHSA up for reauthorization this year, I'm also eager to discuss with him the agency's plans for the future of drug treatment. We're also pleased to be joined by Dr. Nora Vokoff, Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institute of Health, which is the federal government's preeminent authority on the nature of drug addiction and the science of drug treatment. We're also pleased to be joined on the second panel by a number of experts in the field of drug addiction treatment. We welcome Tom Dr. A. Thomas McClellan, Director of the Treatment Research Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Mr. Charles O'Keefe of the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, the Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson, Executive Director of the National Drug Court Institute in Alexandria, Virginia, Dr. Jerome Jaffe, Professor at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, Ms. Catherine Martins, Senior Vice President of Second Genesis in Silver Spring, Maryland, and Dr. Hendry, Hendry Jones, Research Director at the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy in Baltimore, Maryland. We look forward to discussing these issues with you. Now, yield to uh, distinguished ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing on measuring the effectiveness of drug treatment. I've often said that uh, it's one thing to treat uh, drug addiction, it's another thing to be effective in treatment. As you know, Mr. Chairman, drug kills 20,000 Americans each year, and drug abuse and the illegal drug trade contribute to most of the violent crime and social problems we experience here in the United States. Providing effective treatment to people who have become drug dependent is necessary to reduce the demand for illegal drugs that drives consumption and fuels crime and social dysfunction. 
The President has proposed substantial increases in drug treatment funding, including increases for the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant, which accounts for 40 percent of public funding for drug treatment, and the new Access to Recovery Voucher Initiative, for which state applications are being accepted this spring. Under both the Block Grant and Access to Recovery, drug treatment funding is being accompanied by new requirements for outcomes measurement and reporting in an effort to increase accountability and effectiveness in drug treatment programs funded with taxpayers' dollars. I've often said that the one thing that Republicans and Democrats appear to agree on is that the taxpayer's dollar must be spent effectively and efficiently. And these are appropriate goals. In addition to expanding the capacity of the drug treatment system to ensure that treatment is accessible to those in need, we should seek to ensure that the treatment we fund is the very best that it can be. The value of treatment cannot be overstated. Numerous studies attest to the effectiveness of treatment in reducing not only the consumption of drugs and alcohol, but also the social harms associated with addiction, including violent crime, property crime, unemployment, risky health behaviors contributing to HIV and hepatitis infection, and so on. And yet, public funding for drug treatment has been derided by some critics who view drug treatment programs as a revolving door for addicts who lack a moral commitment to abstinence. Addiction research tells us, however, that relapse is a, a component of the disease of addiction and a part of the recovery process for most recovering addicts. Moreover, temporary abstinence and reduced consumption are beneficial for the patient and the community in which the patient lives. And treatment contributes to these intermediate steps as well as the ultimate goal of permanent abstinence. The National Institute on Drug Abuse publication, Principles of Drug Addiction Treatment, a research-based guide, cites several conservative estimates showing that every one dollar invested in addiction treatment programs yields a return of between four and seven dollars in reduced drug-related crime, criminal justice costs, and theft alone. When savings related to health care are included, total savings can exceed costs by a ratio of 12 to 1. The guide further states that drug addiction is a complex illness that nonetheless is just as treatable as other chronic diseases in which patient behavior is a factor, including diabetes, asthma, and hypertension. Evaluations of treatment programs must take into account not only the complexity of the illness, but also the very different life circumstances of patients and the variety of treatment settings in which patients receive treatment. The diversity and types of treatment programs poses a challenge to efforts to establish criteria that will allow for meaningful comparisons. Applying criteria in a manner that is fair and that yields useful evaluations is critical. We have two very distinguished panels of witnesses who will offer their insights on this important subject today. And I am happy that my state of Maryland is so well represented. We are fortunate to have both NIDA and SAMHSA before us on this panel. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, in particular. For, doc, for allowing Dr. Andre Jones and Catherine Martin to testify today as minority witnesses on the second panel. Dr. Jones is research director for the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center in Baltimore. Ms. Martins is senior vice president of Second Genesis, a therapeutic communities program 
in Silver Spring, Maryland. Taking into account the perspectives of treatment providers is critical to the development of evaluation methods that will yield meaningful and useful information leading to more effective treatment. And I'm glad that we will hear these important perspectives today. With that said, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. And I hope that this hearing helps to move us forward towards the goal of reducing drug abuse and dependency in this great country. With that, I yield back. Uh, thank you for your statement. <clears throat> I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions <clears throat> excuse me, for the hearing record and that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record and without objection if so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record and that all members be permitted to revise and extend their remarks Without objection, it's so ordered. <clears throat> now it's our. I'm going to take a drink here. <clears throat> it's the policy of this uh, committee and the full government form committee to swear in our witnesses. So if you each would stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you'll give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. <laughs> Let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. I apologize. I wasn't paying attention. Do you have an uh, opening statement? No. <laughs> Thank you. I was so intent in reading all the materials in front of me, I apologize. We'll start with, um, who do I start with? Mr. Curry, I believe. Is that the correct? Yes. Yeah, we'll start with Mr. Curry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Good afternoon. I am Charles Curie, Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This time I ask, my, ask that my formal written testimony be included in the record of this hearing. In the time I have with you today, I will describe how SAMHSA is working to promote and provide effective substance abuse treatment to people nationwide, and I will describe how we are measuring the effectiveness of those efforts. The importance of substance abuse treatment prevention services is undeniable. I'm also pleased to be appearing here today with my colleague, Dr. Nora Volkov of NIDA. The partnership is critical in us accomplishing that goal. According to our 2002 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, of the 22.8 million people aged 12 and older who needed treatment for alcohol or drugs, only 2.3 million of them received specialized care. Over 85% of people with untreated alcohol or drug problems said they didn't think they needed care. Of the 1.2 million people who felt they did need treatment, 446,000 tried but were unable to get treatment. The result, continued addiction, loss of health, employment and education, and often criminal involvement. That's a huge human and economic cost. Yet we know federal investments in substance abuse prevention and treatment are cost effective and beneficial. Treatment is effective. Recovery is real. SAMHSA's National Treatment Improvement Evaluation Study, NTIES, found a 50% reduction in drug use one year after treatment. It reported up to an 80% reduction in criminal activity, a 43% drop in homelessness, and a nearly 20% rise in employment. Our findings are corroborated by other SAMHSA and NIDA studies. We're also working to prevent substance abuse in the first place. The President set aggressive goals to reduce youth drug use in America. With effective prevention efforts, rates are dropping. 11% in the past two years among 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students, according to NIDA's most recent Monitoring the Future survey. That's roughly 400,000 fewer teen drug users in these two years. And that means the President's two-year goal has been exceeded. Let me remind everyone what SAMHSA is all about. In contrast to NIH, SAMHSA is not a research agency. We don't conduct or fund research. SAMHSA is a services agency. That means taking our work and our substance abuse prevention and treatment services programs to where people are, in communities nationwide. That's why our programs, policies, and budget priorities are driven by the vision of a life in the community for everyone. That's why they're driven by a mission of building resilience and facilitating recovery one person at a time. 
And that's why each and every one of our program outcomes is being measured against the yardstick of recovery, resilience, and that life in the community for every man, woman, and child. Our vision and mission are aligned with those of President Bush and Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson. We appreciate their leadership and support for our vision of a life in the community for everyone. Three concepts at the heart of today's hearing guide our work, accountability, capacity, and effectiveness. ACE is the acronym. We assess ACE by gathering and analyzing data about our programs. But we're not collecting data for the sake of collecting data. Today we're asking why we are collecting the data and whether the measure outcomes that are meaningful for real people working to make recovery a reality. If they don't, they simply won't be collected. That's why we've been working with the states to change the ways in which we assess our discretionary and block grant programs. It's an approach that focuses questions and expectations on success and substance abuse treatment and prevention measured in real-time outcomes for real people. The result has been the identification of an agreement on seven outcome domains, the very outcomes that help people obtain and sustain recovery. First and foremost is abstinence from drug use and alcohol abuse. Without that, recovery and a life in the community are impossible. Two other domains, increased access to services and increased retention and treatment, relate directly to the treatment process itself. We measure whether our programs, in fact, are helping people who want and need treatment get the care they need over the duration they need it and with the social supports that are most beneficial to each individual. The remaining four domains focus on sustaining treatment and recovery, increased employment or return to school education, decreased criminal justice involvement, increases in stabilized family and living condition, and increases in support from and connectedness to the community. These measures are true measures of recovery. They measure whether our programs are helping people achieve and sustain recovery. By focusing our program outcome data collection on just these seven domains over time, we can foster continuous program and policy. We can know whether our efforts to move new scientific knowledge from NIDA to the front lines of service delivery, our science to services efforts are working for people. Samson's Addiction Technology Transfer Centers, ATTCs, are, are an example. They encourage the adoption of evidence-based practices by alcohol and drug abuse treatment programs and providers. Through our ATTCs, we work with NIDA to disseminate new knowledge specifically related to the results of NIDA research. We'll know whether these efforts are paying dividends in reaching recovery and promoting abstinence from drugs. Giving people an opportunity to obtain sustained recovery is at the heart of the President's Access to Recovery initiative. That's the first place we'll use the seven domains to assess our outcomes. As you know and has been indicated, Access to Recovery is a new substance abuse treatment grant program funded at $100 million in FY04 and for which the President is seeking $200 million in FY2005. ATR fosters consumer choice, improves service quality, and increases treatment capacity by provi providing individuals with vouchers to pay for substance abuse treatment they need. At the same time, SAMHSA has been working with the states to transform its substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant program into a performance-based system. To begin, states will be asked to voluntarily submit data on the seven domains as we integrate performance accountability into the system. SAMHSA has invested significant resources to help states build their state data infrastructures. We will work with them to promote better accountability, not just for where the dollars are being spent, but how effectively those dollars are being used. By focusing program measurement and management on the seven outcome domains, SAMHSA, states, communities, and this subcommittee can gain a powerful tool to guide the policies and program direction of today. For the first time, we can paint a picture of the effectiveness of drug treatment as it relates to recovery. We will ensure that our programs remain focused on the real-time needs of people working toward recovery and a life in the community. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee. I'd be pleased to respond to any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Dr. Nora Volkoff, Director of the National Institute for Drug Abuse at NIH. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Souther and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting the National Institute on Drug Abuse to join with our colleagues at SAMHSA and others to participate in this important hearing. I am pleased to be here at my very first hearing before Congress. What I would like to do today is share with you what science is teaching us about the chronic relapsing nature of addiction and the impact this has on how we treat patients 
and how we measure treatment effectiveness. Every one of us is in this room because we want to do something about the tremendous burden that drug abuse has on our society. Illicit drug use costs our nation $161 billion a year. But that number is very small compared to the impact that drugs can have on individuals, families, and communities. Drug abuse can lead to crime, domestic violence, child abuse, among others. It is also a leading vector for many diseases, including HIV, AIDS, hepatitis. Fortunately, our investments in biomedical research to improve the health of all Americans are paying off, especially in how we approach and treat addiction. Research shows us that addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder associated with long-lasting changes in the brain that can affect all aspects of a person's life. New advances are beginning to increase our understanding of the developmental nature of addiction. Addiction is a disease that starts in adolescence and sometimes even in childhood. The urgency to combat substance abuse and addiction is highlighted by the number. 2.9 million 12 to 17 year old individuals are currently using illicit drugs. This is a time when the brain is undergoing major changes in both structure and function. If we do not intervene early, drug problems can last a lifetime. For this reason, neither, neither is encouraging new research such that pediatricians and other primary care physicians have the tools, skills, and knowledge to screen and treat patients as early as possible. We are also working with our colleagues from SAMHSA and others to rapidly, if rapidly bring new treatments to providers. For example, a little over a year ago, with the help of many of you who are in this room, we were able to bring the new medication buprenorphine to qualified physicians. For the first time, doctors can treat patients who are addicted to opiates such as heroin and oxycontin in their own offices. Over three decades of research demonstrate that treatment works. We have summarized these findings in, our, in one of our most popular publications to date the principles of drug addiction treatment, commonly referred to as the Blue Book. This Blue Book has been distributed to over 12,000 providers and provides the basic principles that research studies have shown to be necessary for successful treatment. As with other chronic illnesses, treatment for drug addiction in most cases is a long-term process. In fact, the effectiveness of treatment for addiction is similar to that for other chronic relapsing disorders, such as diabetes, asthma, hypertension, heart disease, and many forms of cancer. Indeed, treatment compliance, dropout rates, and relapse are similar for all of these chronic diseases. The chronic nature of drug addiction di dictates the need for ongoing care. The importance of this strategy is illustrated by studies of aftercare in criminal justice settings. Studies in Delaware and California have shown that treating drug abusers while they are in prison and continuing to provide treatment and other services while they transition to the community reduces drug use by 50 to 70 percent. It also reduces the likelihood that they are returned to prison by about 50 percent. However, without the aftercare component, the effects of treatment largely disappear. In addition, because drug addiction is associated with disruption across multiple dimensions of a person's life, treatment requires addressing not just, that the, drug, not just the drug use, but also its consequences, which can include medical complications such as HIV AIDS and hepatitis, mental illness such as depression, anxiety, suicide, criminal justice involvement, unemployment, and problems with family and social functioning, among others. Conceptualizing drug addiction as a chronic relapsing disease that requires ongoing treatment and that affects multiple dimensions of an individual's life that need to be addressed for recovery will require that we change the way we provide and measure treatment. 
We particularly applaud some SAMHSA for focusing on the multiple dimensions of drug abuse outcomes because this is consistent with our scientific understanding of the complexities of this illness. Like other areas of healthcare, standardized measures of drug abuse treatment effectiveness have not yet been developed, and I commend this committee for its interest in this important topic. Thank you very much. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. I thank you both for your uh, testimony, and let me first, um, uh, I believe your statement was very clear, Mr. Curry, but I, I want to ask it again for the record because as the administration moved into several of these new initiatives, one of the most common questions was, is were new grantees going to be treated differently in accountability than previous grantees? As I understood your statement, you said whether or not it was discretionary or block granted, you were looking for a continuity of measurement where all would be measured in similar ways? That, that is correct. Uh, again, we're able to operationalize it with access to recovery, uh, and we're asking states or tribal entities who are responding to that RFA to demonstrate how they will either incent or, or assure uh, measurement uh, from, from providers who are eligible providers to receive the voucher. Uh, at the same time, as we move ahead with uh, performance measures around the block grant, other targeted capacity expansion grants, we're looking at these seven domains being uh, common measurements we're requiring uh, of, of, of all grantees. Uh, and, and the primary reason is uh, there, there's been consensus in the field that these seven domains represent recovery, uh, represent measurement of, a, of someone who is in recovery. And, uh, and that's really the goal of all of our, our services that we are uh, uh, funding. Um, Dr. Volkoff just said in her her uh, uh, testimony uh, and her uh, written testimony, it's expanded on the impact of comprehensive treatment. And in the written testimony, it also says that in the studies in Delaware and California, that offenders who are treated in prison are less likely, if they have comprehensive treatment, to end up back in prison. But if they do not receive the aftercare, despite receiving in-prison treatment, they have poor outcomes. And my question to you first, Mr. Curry, and then Dr. Volkoff, if you could as well, are we interconnecting the different programs at this point in the Department of Justice and what you're doing, and what can we do to encourage more of that t type of cooperation? I know, for example, in, in Fort Wayne area, we know, both know well, uh, they have Justice Department grants for a uh, continuum of, of care and nurse person back in the community. Congressman Davis has a bill that I support on housing questions. But are we seeing these things coming together? Because so many of us see people who are uh, been through a treatment program and they go right back in. And the question is, how can we integrate and look at this more holistically from the federal government level? No, absolutely. I think the answer is yes, we are making great progress in that area. We do have uh, joint programs with the Department of Justice. We're funding. Uh, the treatment components of reentry courts. Uh, uh, again, the Fort Wayne uh, is, is an example of a, a reentry court. And we, we're providing the treatment, and an understanding we're developing with justice is uh, our responsibility for, for funding community based treatment as individuals are coming out of the justice system, uh, as well as uh, our collaboration on drug courts. Uh, and uh, again, we have a commitment between both departments to, to, to continue to foster uh, that relationship. Uh, I think we all, all are in agreement that the uh, treatment and recovery support systems and the community-based side of things need to be integrated, and, and you don't want to see a separate criminal justice community-based system of care, but if we truly are working for individuals to have that life in the community, it needs to be part of the overall public health focus. Before I follow up with Dr. Volkoff on that particular question, when you give block grant money to the states, is there any guidance to them that says, we want this integrated with the drug courts, with other reentry programs, uh, and not just, okay, we're pursuing this thing at the federal level and these different agencies, and you're pursuing this, and we don't get a match. At the, at the block grant, there are um, uh, various uh, directives and statute around the block grant. Uh, the states do have a lot of latitude block grants. That's the very thing we're examining as we move to PPGs, is how we can uh, measure and, and incent, if you will, uh, a system with uh, further integration. The other thing I might mention, there, there are block grant dollars I know at, in, in, in a wide range of states that are going toward uh, treating individuals who are coming out of the criminal justice system. Also with the access to recovery, uh, 
uh, nothing precludes a state. In fact, we've encouraged as one scenario, a state or a tribal organization may want to use the vouchers in connection with a drug court or reentry court program and actually begin their voucher program with that specialty population. And we anticipate we're going to see those types of models proposed. Dr. Volkoff, have you seen any of these integrated studies? Are you setting up any tracking to see whether or not we're getting the results when we have a drug court a reentry program and uh, a prison treatment program or a community funding program? Are, we, are you able to see enough of these that you can start to research it and see whether uh, what was suggested in the state studies might in fact be true? Yeah, indeed, this is one of our priority areas, how to actually develop knowledge that optimizes the way that we uh, bring the uh, prisoners or the parolees back into the community. So we have a strategy, actually, that for a better term, we're calling an initiative, NIDA goes to jail. And it has multiple components. One of them is actually to generate the knowledge, for example, and to create the infrastructure. One of the programs that we have stored, started is what we call the Criminal Justice uh, uh, Research Abuse Treatment, the CJ DADS. And these are seven criminal systems working with the um, academic centers to develop research, por, uh, research protocols to optimize the reentry of uh, the prisoner back into the community. And that's one. The other one is to uh, interact with uh, SAMHSA, but also to interact with the Department of Justice to bring education about the science of addiction and the treatments that are available. So that's the educational component. And finally, the, the other aspects that we're working with, which we're also addressing, is the whole uh, issue on research about that, unfortunately, what, what uh, in the substance abuse, substance abuse that, um, in many of the individuals that are end up in prison is uh, frequently associated with comorbid mental illness. So that is another area which for, for which we don't have sufficient research. And in parallel to this initiative, there's, of course, a parallel one for the criminal juvenile of offenders. Can I ask one supplemental question with that while we're looking at it comprehensively, because I'm, I know all the members are interested in this as well. We didn't mention, or I didn't, and nor did you, any labor department or education department. Are we looking at any attempt to look at vocational education and or uh, employment uh, as part of in this rehab where that would be integrated as well? Yes, in fact, uh, uh, employment, uh, one of the major domains, employment and education, which reflect uh, a, a, a dimension of recovery, uh, we are looking at collaborating with labor. We are looking at potentially, I know a reentry program is being proposed, uh, uh, was proposed by the president, which would be focused on just that. And uh, with the efforts between justice and HHS at this point around uh, bringing individuals back in the community to succeed, it will make a lot of sense to be engaged in that process to make sure we have a comprehensive approach. Also, uh, on, on uh, a, a related uh, side of the equation, uh, the, uh, on the mental health agenda side, we have an action agenda around transforming the mental health system, which will address co-occurring disorders, which has a clear connect to uh, addictive disorders. And with that, uh, we have labor at the table collaborating with us uh, around models uh, that work to help people gain employment. Mr. Cummings. Thank you all, <clears throat> all very much for being here. Uh, Mr. Fulcow, tell me exactly what you mean, what's your definition of aftercare? After you just said it's important that you have aftercare. And I just want to know what are the essential, essential ingredients for what you deem to be effective aftercare? Well, aftercare, are you as referring to uh, the aftercare for someone that has been in jail or prison or just aftercare for any drug abusing person that ends up in a health care facility? Both. Um, but what it, what it basically requires is that it starts the after her scare, after health care, and this is actually one of the things that has been very clearly summarized in the principles of drug addiction. And what they've uh, has been uh, there's consensus is that initial when in the initial reentry of the person you are focusing on stopping the drug use, while at the same tar time starting to engage the patient on realizing what are the positive and the negative aspects of taking drugs. Once the individual recognizes he, he, 
key, the key position on this uh, stance, he's taken to the next step, which is to teach the individual what are the actions that he needs to do in order to optimize his chances to not take drugs. So that's the first stage. Once that is uh, achieved, the patient goes onto what we call aftercare, and the patient is released into the community, and that requires that there have to be a follow-up either, and there are several programs that can be utilized. There's nothing like a recipe, this works for that person, so the first thing that has to be realized is that the treatments have to be tailored for the unique circumstances and characteristics of the patient. And that will require that uh, the several aspects that SAMHSA is focusing in are addressed. So in the aftercare, you need to address not just the substance abuse, but actually the integration of the individual to a supportive community, which ideally should be a family. And if the family doesn't exist, what are the community? The, the support into the, the integration into the community requires, if it's an adult, that they, are, they have employment and if it is a younger person, that they are able to follow an educational system. At the same time, what this science has taught us is that self-help groups are usually very beneficial. And in certain instances, uh, the, the notion of medication can help uh, drug-addicted persons stay away from drugs. And finally, but not because it's least important, again, I'm going to reiterate, unfortunately, substance abuse is frequently comorbid with mental illness. And if the issue of mental illness is not addressed, you're very unlikely to succeed on getting that person out of drugs. So that's what the aftercare entails, being able to uh, monitor all of these different dimensions that have unfortunately been affected by the drug addiction process. So you, um, I was waiting for you to say it, and you finally did say it, a job is helpful in it. One of the things that we've come to realize that we are human beings, one of the most important aspects that motivates our behavior is that to be part of a group, that to be part of a community, being felt that we are appreciated, that we can contribute to that community. It's one of the most important aspects that motivates our actions in life. So when you bring a person into a community and you make him feel that they are part of it, you actually achieve a great deal of that therapeutic process. Now, Mr. Carey, you were with us in Fort Wayne, were you not? Yes, I was. And um, if you'll recall, when we were in Fort Wayne with the chairman, uh, a lot of those judges came forward and talked about how they were so upset that the state law, I th that's what they were talking about, I think, had precluded, because somebody had a drug offense on their record, had precluded them from getting so many jobs. And they were very upset. And when I go to the inner city in Baltimore, I talk about that because they think that it's only a problem in the inner city. Uh, and so we, um, then I just heard Ms. Vocal talk about how jobs is a part of getting that back person back into society. I mean, uh, is there any efforts to try to look at some of these state laws I mean, on the part of, of either of you all, and I don't know if that even comes under your purview, but so, so that we can get people back to having some hope and being able to get back and circulate in society, since that's such a crucial part of recovery? I think you make a very good point. I'm not aware of any formal uh, 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 reviews of, of looking at that. I think it, 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 it'd be a worthwhile endeavor, though, to to consider, especially since we are using recovery now as our framing of, of service delivery. Historically, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Volkoff was, was uh, when she's talking about aftercare, uh, historically, I think from the public uh, sector side of things as we finance services, we have focused primarily on the clinical treatment or the treatment intervention and not on the whole recovery picture. We've begun now focusing on the whole recovery picture, recognizing that relapse is less likely to occur if people are attaining those uh, real-life goals of employment, education, stable housing, uh, connectedness to family and friends, connectedness to the community. Uh, and uh, so as we are basically embarking, uh, I would say, in a relatively new chapter as we look at how, what we're financing, I think the type of review you've described would be worthwhile because 
historically, you never heard us talking necessarily to labor uh, or, or, or to education uh, about how we help individuals build a life. We used to think if we provided access to care and some forms of care, we were done with our mission. We're recognizing today we're not finished with our mission. Just one other thing. When I talk to uh, people who, um, in my district, who are recovering, are recovering addicts, um, one of their biggest concerns is a job. And, they, and, and, and the more I think about it combined with what you just said, I mean, it really makes sense. One, they need another family. In other words, the family that got them on drugs, they need to get away from that group or they'll be right back where they started. Two, I guess it does, Dr. Vokal, give them a sense of worth. Three, it gives them a whole lot more eyes looking over their shoulder, like, like the, the man, the, the woman who's their boss or the person that they become familiar with and becomes the friend that they eat lunch with or the people that go out and play baseball after work, all that kind of thing. So I guess when you talk about, so it's basically what we're talking about is sort of a shifting from one lifestyle and trying to shift them over to another lifestyle that includes new people and new opportunities to change and get away from what sent them there in the first place. Exactly. Like Goals, aspirations. You mentioned hope earlier. It's all part of it. Uh, your experience parallels mine through my career when I ask the question of people who, uh, what they need, people who, are, who have an addictive disease or disorder, and they don't define it that they need a clinical program or they need a treatment. They define that they're looking for a job, a home, and, and a quote that I give many times is a date on the weekends, uh, connectedness to build, to build a new life and a life. And, uh, and a job also strikes not only at giving someone a sense of worth, but in our society, the basic question you're asked when you enter a neighborhood is, what do you do? If you don't have an answer to that question already, you're on a slippery slope uh, uh, in terms of acceptance in that community. So a job goes to basically uh, our identity uh, in, in this society. Just, just as a footnote is also asked, you know, when you're at a party and the fellow's talking to a young lady, well, she wants to know, what do you do? I mean, do you work and do you have a job? Anyway, I just thought I'd slip no, that in. Thank you. <laughs> Congresswoman Blackburn has been very involved in this before she came to Congress, and we had an uh, excellent hearing in her district as well with a number of remarkable people in Tennessee and the region down there who've been working in these kind of uh, follow through issues. Thank That's you for exactly joining us. right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to my colleague, he was speaking in terms of family, and I was sitting here making some notes about the. Um, uh, before he started uh, speaking on that issue, the importance of a family uh, or an extended family or well-placed mentors. And I do applaud our president and uh, the fact that he has developed mentoring programs, that he is a supporter of faith-based initiatives, as the chairman was saying, the hearing we did in my district and the very active work and participation that has taken place on that. Um, so uh, I agree with what he's saying, that, that those life skills that many times our educational system no longer teaches, but it is very important that we have families and mentors to fill that void and to teach those uh, skills to young people. Uh, thank you both for being here and appearing before us. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Volko, I want to thank you specifically for using the front and back of your paper. We conservatives like to see that. On your submitted testimony, it is wonderful that uh, we doubled up there. You know, just think of what we could do to cut the use of uh, paper in half if we were to use the front and back of that paper. So we thank you for that. Uh, a couple of questions that I do have looking through your testimony. Dr. Curry, I want to start with you first, please, sir. Um, as you reference the programs and the studies that you have done, one of the things I'm not seeing is the complete universe of individuals in your programs. And I'm going to ask these in bulk to save time and let you ask them, answer them. Um, out of the individuals in the program, the length of time they were in their programs, uh, one of the things from the state level that we've learned is that short programs do want, don't work, longer programs do work. 
uh, then out of this universe, what is the recidivism rate? And uh, do you have any documented evidence on uh, tying the length of the program to the recidivism rate? Um, and looking at your accountabilities, and I appreciate your spelling out the seven domains. I think that is, that is really uh, excellent. Do we know how much we're spending per individual to move them through this program? And uh, let me, let me uh, go ahead and finish here. And then when we look at the states, and both of you mentioned working with the states, um, as you move them through this, have you developed some type software that you are some type program that they're going to be able to submit this accountability data to you and our grantees, if they are not accountable, is there a process for withholding money or moving them out of the program? And I know that's a lot to throw out, but I've got five minutes, and so I wanted to be sure I got all of these things uh, before both of you. Understood. Um, I can, I can share with you information uh, about specific programs and the link between uh, uh, longevity within the program and relapse. And we have that mainly right. on specific programs, uh, sometimes by, by state. There is no real comprehensive national picture of that. And that's one reason we want the seven domains to be consistent among all grants, uh, because we think that will help us begin to paint more of the national picture. Excellent. Before you continue, Mr. Chairman, I would like to request that we have that submitted for the record and for our review as we look at progress. Thank you, sir. Please continue. Very good. And, and as, as we move ahead in terms of working with the states, state data infrastructure is, is a real critical issue. When you, when you speak to, to the states, uh, you understand that uh, there's many demands on their particular state budget. At the same time, uh, they have state legislators and governors who, who want to have this information for them to make informed decisions. So there is an alignment of, of goals. We are providing both resources and technical assistance to states to help them develop their data infrastructure. Also working with states, there are certain states that have uh, excellent data uh, information systems that uh, can be used as models for other states. So we're also looking to work with uh, the, the National Association of State Alcohol and, and uh, uh, Drug Directors to uh, uh, accommodate that. But that is a priority and it's going to be essential in order for us to gain the data we need uh, to, to measure performance. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Do you want to go? No, I, I know it's running out on me. That's fine. Go ahead. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for calling this hearing. Um, I've gotten very into this whole business. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm leading an initiative effort in Illinois to get a referendum on the November ballot calling for drug treatment on demand. And we've got to get 300,000 signatures. We've gotten about 60,000 <laughs> that I have in my office <laughs> in a safe right now. <laughs> uh, one of the a real the, strong safe in Chicago. Well, let me just tell you the the headlines and in, in the Chicago Sun Times on Monday uh, suggest that Chicago is now number two in in the nation in drug overdoses. Philadelphia is number one, Chicago is number two, and of course lots of folks thought that the increase would be in the inner city area of Chicago, but it's actually more prevalent in the suburban communities outside Chicago, and especially with teenagers uh, using heroin. And, and so it's a big, big issue and a big problem. One of the questions that, that we find people are asking as, as we deal with our, our referendum effort is, is the, how effective is treatment? That is, if individuals get treated, then so what? Uh, what's the difference between the recidivism rate for those who are treated, those who are not? And we got into it really because there's such a 
close relationship between crime and drug use and abuse. I mean, most of the crime that we encounter is in some way, shape, form, or fashion drug-related, drug-connected. And so we got to thinking that if we could reduce drug use, we also could reduce crime, and that we could save ourselves a tremendous amount of money, human misery, and all of the other problems that are associated. So Dr. Vol Volko, is there a, a, a discernible difference in different kinds of treatment and their effectiveness? I'm, I'm saying, do we have enough data to suggest that people who are treated one way, the recidivism rate might be one thing. If they're treated another way, it may be something different. Yes, there, there is some data for certain of the drug addictions, particularly for heroin, where we have compared the recidivism for one type of treatment versus the other. In the case of heroin, we of course have methadone and buprenorphine, and indeed studies have shown uh, very, very clearly and cogently that treatment with these medications significantly reduces relapse. And actually the, the relapse reduction is significantly greater than basically other types of uh, treatment intervention. So for the case of heroin addiction, that is the case. In, for other types of addictions, there is not enough research yet to compare one modality versus the other. But there are two aspects that I think I'm going to reiterate that are very, very relevant. Number one, when you compare one modality versus the other, you have to consider that not every addict is the same and nor are there circumstances. And that's why I made the point before, you have to be able to tailor treatment accordingly to the needs of an individual. So it's not going to be a transparent comparison of one versus the other. And the other thing that I want to reiterate, because it's extremely important and it has hurt the field tremendously, is the notion that when you provide a treatment and there's relapse, automatically it was felt that there was failure, when in fact relapse may not be failure. Indeed, when you are treating someone for hypertension, if the blood pressure has been stabilized for six months and one day it goes up, did you fail? You do not fail, you restart treatment. So, even though relapse is part of the process, it does not necessarily mean that uh, medications have failed. And that's one of the aspects that we have to start to change on the way that we evaluate treatment. So when we are, and we are setting up the comparisons of different, we have the clinical trial network, whose function is among others to do exactly what you're asking, to compare the different modalities to be able to optimize what is maybe best for a given individual. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got to run to another hearing, but I would like to ask one additional question, if I could, and, 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 and that is, is there enough information that we've been able to evaluate relative to faith-based efforts? And, I mean, we had an event Saturday, and I had about 400 recovering or people in recovery. And since I've been working so closely with them, I've learned so many things that I really hadn't thought about in terms of who's addicted. Uh, a lot of people seem to think that individuals who are addicted are thrill seekers, macho people, are people looking for, and, and one of the things I've discovered is that many of the people who become addicted are lacking in self-esteem and that somehow or another, whatever it is that they end up using or whatever we, we were doing, role playing and all of that to get them ready to go out and help get these signatures. And there were some individuals who just simply could not ask a person to sign a petition because they couldn't look at them. I'm, I'm saying, and even when they would be talking, they'd be looking away, you know, kind of, and, and, of course, the faith-based stuff seemed to help with that somewhat. I mean, are, is there any data relative to the effectiveness of faith-based efforts? The answer is there has not been enough research in this area. We are currently funding several grants that are specifically addressing the role of spirituality in the recovery process. 
and in all, because uh, most of the treatments that are available for drug uh, addiction incorporate faith base into their systems, we are explicitly requesting in all of our program announcements and requests for proposals that faith-based organizations um, were encouraging them to apply for these uh, funds. So unfortunately, there is not enough research that has been done, but we are actually encouraging the community to come and request grants so that we can start to look at these questions that you are asking. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I find this to be very valuable, and I really appreciate your leadership in the area. So thank Thanks. you. Thanks. If you have additional written questions you want to submit for the second panel, we can do that as well. If I could uh, ask a follow-up on that, uh, that uh, faith-based point. We've been doing a series of field hearings around the country, both on narcotics and on faith-based. And one of the things we heard in San Antonio, uh, as well as in Los Angeles and a few other places, were that faith-based uh, drug treatment programs, one of the things that has been an effective measure, and, and uh, disagree with me if this is incorrect, but I think most people agree that the more inclined a person is to uh, want to get off their addiction, the more success there is. Uh, not saying that it, you have to have voluntary compliance or seeking a program uh, to make it successful, but the more one is prepared to be uh, have a ch life changing experience, the more likely you are for success. And that one of the roles of the faith based organizations is, is preparing their hearts and a change in their life that prepares them for the drug treatment. Um, is that one of the things you might be looking at in the research, and has that come up before? Because that's a little different than saying it's, a, it's precisely a drug treatment program. It's saying that because they're willing to make a life changing and there are, they're transforming their life, that that has prepared them now mentally to go through a drug treatment program. And indeed, what you are saying is correct, and it's the basis of a therapy called trans transcendental therapy, and has been shown to be effective not just for drug addiction, for but and other types of behavioral disorders, where the main element is to make the person aware that they want to really incorporate the sense that they want to ch make a change in their life. Extremely important component that does predict whether a person will succeed or not. Yet at the same time, you also state that it doesn't necessarily what what we've shown is that it doesn't necessarily treatment to be voluntary, but it does the motivation of the person to change is indispensable. As for your question about what is the role of faith-based organization on helping drive the person to really accept and incorporate that need to change and willingness to change is one of the items that may indeed be playing a role. But, but we, ha we have to do the studies to demonstrate it. It's likely, I mean, the question scientifically is what are the active ingredients that determine the benefits for faith-based approaches? And it's likely that one of them may be, but that's, that's why we're doing the work. We don't have answers yet. So one can just predict, and it does, from previous research, it does make sense that this may be one of the variables. I, I would say one common denom denominator among all all programs, whether they're uh, faith-based or, or they're not faith-based, could again be the seven domains being a, a way of judging outcome and effectiveness over time as well. And, and I think uh, those domains can be utilized uh, with a wide range of interventions. Also, I think with faith-based approaches, recovery is such an individualized process that if, if, if uh, uh, Congressman Davis said that there were 400 people in recovery in the room, there were there would probably be 400 different stories of recovery, some with common elements, but the role faith plays, sometimes it's an upfront role as you've just described, sometimes it's a role that once they've been through a medically-based program in order to sustain recovery in the 12-step program, uh, the, the spiritual component of that helps them sustain recovery. Uh, so I think faith can play, play a role at different levels uh, in, in an individual's life. And, and uh, again, I think the biggest challenge for us is in using recovery as our framing, both public policy and, and public finance, is that it is such an individualized process. I want to ask uh, one other question. The most spectacular failure, certainly in North America and possibly the world, is Vancouver, British Columbia right now uh, in their needle exchange program and now on top of having the world's highest HIV infection rate, uh, they've got this huge expanded market of actual heroin addicts, and now this high uh, uh, PHC 
uh, marijuana. It's now corrupted several <coughs> officials in their government. They're being prosecuted, uh, going down the path of, of Colombia, more or less, uh, and what happened in Mexico before those governments started to, to uh, tackle it. In um, uh, Vancouver, they started this program in 88. They're now up to two, 2 million needles that they're distributing on the street. And people call that harm reduction. And I wanted to have two clarifications here. One is there's a difference between harm reduction defined that way, which is more of a maintenance question. In other words, a heroin addict is getting a needle. Uh, the presumption is you would reduce AIDS, which has not necessarily been proven. But the presumption is that you would reduce AIDS, but you wouldn't treat the heroin. Uh, that that is different than the treatment programs you're talking about. You're not talking about maintenance, you're talking about changing someone's addiction. And then the second thing I wanted to make sure we were clarified on is, is that do needle exchange, uh, do we have any data or what percentage of people who actually get the needle exchange go to treatment or in fact does giving the needle perpetuate it and then they don't see the need for treatment? What uh, research has shown, actually, it's interesting because you were making, make, making the statement in the way that you were saying, which is absolutely correct, that just providing needles by itself is not helping anyone. But what research has shown is that needle exchange programs in the line of a comprehensive drug treatment program have been shown to reduce HIV and have also increased the likelihood that these individuals will stay for treatment. So, Drug, I mean, needle exchange by itself is not going to solve the problem, not at all. And, and it also addresses another aspect that is very relevant. When we look at one thing, we sort of say we're looking at treatment. And the other aspect that I view which is very relevant is that of prevention. So what, what is the message that we're sending with respect to prevention on, in terms of just exchanging needles? And that's why when we bring up the issue, we basically say what science has told us is needle exchange programs in line with a comprehensive drug abuse treatment program have shown, in fact, to do reduce the cases of HIV when they are combined, not by itself. Um, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, the treatment programs we are talking about are not about harm reduction. In fact, when we talk about prevention, in recovery, we're not talking about harm reduction, but harm elimination. It's it's a, a bottom line of the risk factors. We need to eliminate those in the prevention scenario. And as one attains and, and sustains recovery, they begin to manage their illness, they begin to manage their life. And, and that goes much beyond a harm reduction vision. Well, I thank you both for your testimony. And we'll probably have some written follow-ups, not only from me, but other members in the subcommittee. Uh, thank you, Mr. That, Chairman. Thank you for coming. Thanks. If the second panel could come forward, and as you come forward, if you could remain standing so we can do the oath. raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, self of God? Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We thank you all for being here today. Um, our first witness is Dr. Thomas McClellan, Director, Treatment Research Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I wrote on no sides, so i have just read it here. I'm Tom McClellan. I'm a researcher at the substance abuse treatment field from the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and the Treatment Research Institute there. I'm not an advocate, and neither I nor my institute represent any treatment or government organization. I offer evidence on the effects of treatments for alcohol, 
opiate, cocaine, and amphetamine addiction based on my own work of over 400 uh, reviewed studies and based on reviews. I'm the editor of the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment, so I see many reviews of other work. I have very simple five points to make. First, um, addiction treatment can be evaluated. It's not something that you have to wonder about. The same standards of evidence apply as apply to the evaluation of medications and interventions commonly done in the Food and Drug Administration. There are over 700 published studies of contemporary treatments, so there, there is an evidence base. Now, the point two, effectiveness does not mean cure. We do not have a reliable cure. Yes, there are many people in the field who have um, become abstinent and live productive lives. They are probably not going to be able to drink or use drugs socially again, so there isn't a cure. On the other hand, an evaluation perspective and a determination of effectiveness shouldn't just mean that the patient feels better. Um, the, the scientific basis for uh, effectiveness means three things as it's commonly evaluated. First is the significant reduction of the substance use. Alcohol, cigarettes, opiates, cocaine, amphetamine, significant reduction. Second is improvement in personal health and social function basically a reduction of the individual's response, the society's responsibility uh, on, for the individual. And the third piece of evidence is reduction in public health and public safety threats. Um, and that's what we mean by um, effective. Now, point three, not all treatments are effective. Um, some treatments are quite competent, some, some treatment programs are quite competent, some aren't, uh, like any other field. Uh, certain treatments do not work. We've talked about them already. Detoxifications, for example, do not work unless they're followed by continuing care. Acupuncture does not work unless it's part of some other broader thing. Uh, many contemporary treatment components have not been evaluated. They've simply been adopted well uh, uh, before uh, modern uh, methods have been brought to bear. Uh, and also, many evidence-based treatments, treatments that were discussed by uh, doctors Volkoff and, and Curie, are not in practice because of financing and training issues, and I, I'll come to that. Better treatments have the following characteristics in general. I'm happy to answer specific questions, but in general, longer is better in an outpatient setting, and which includes monitoring. One of the congressmen asked one of the uh, components in monitoring is an important one. Better treatments include tailored social and medical services. Better treatments typically involve family. Fourth point, addiction treatment is not the same as it used to be, but the evaluation of addiction treatment is the same as it used to be, and it doesn't fit anymore. Uh, not so long ago, over 60% of addiction treatment was delivered in a residential facility someplace. You went someplace to that famous 28-day <coughs> worth of treatment. And the question was, how long do the good effects last? So you did a six-month, 12-month post-treatment evaluation. In general, relapse rates were 50% just about anywhere you went, okay? Now, addiction treatment isn't delivered in residential facilities anymore. Over 90% of addiction treatment in this country is done out uh, on the street in outpatient settings. People are ambulatory. My point there is it's too late to wait six months, 12 months after they're out of that kind of care. What you want to know is are people attaining abstinence? Are they attaining employment? Are they uh, being rearrested? Are they using expensive hospital resources? And that has not caught up yet. The, the kinds of studies that have been done have to be uh, able to, to give people. That's real accountability in the field, if you ask my opinion, now, because that's where treatment is. It's on the street. Final thing I have to simply say, is that the basic infrastructure of the United States treatment system is in very bad condition. Um, program closures or takeovers are over 20 percent a year. Program directors make less money than prison guards and have fewer benefits. 
great majority of programs have no full-time physician, no psychologist, no social worker. That's the majority of treatment programs in the country. Counselor turnover rates are comparable to the fast food industry. Pay is terrible, um, and there aren't standards. Uh, though there are well-studied, excellent medications and therapies available, thanks to the uh, work of the National Institute on Alcoholism, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and, and CSAT, uh, frankly, most cannot be uh, adopted um, by the present system. This is a system that can't be regulated into um, effectiveness. It's going to have to have financing, incentives to bring professionals into the field, to retain them, and it needs uh, th that's kind of infrastructure to provide the kinds of things that are associated with better treatments have to be available. And that concludes my testimony. Thank you. We'll now go to Mr. O'Keefe from the Virginia Commonwealth University. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's a privilege to be here this afternoon. Others testifying today will address more directly the measurement of the success of treatment effectiveness. I hope to provide the committee with a perspective on, the over, on overall treatment policy. Together, these perspectives will, I hope, help the committee in its deliberations about the best strategies to improve drug addiction treatment. The main point I wish to make today is that federal policy is not optimal for the development and or deployment of new treatments. There have been some recent improvements, but much more needs to be done. As you know well, Mr. Chairman, because of longstanding strong federal regulation, the system for treating opiate dependence has evolved as one separated, even isolated, from the normal practice of medicine. This has resulted in a disconnect between the findings of the research community and the practices of treatment providers. In 1972, thanks to the work of the country's first drug czar, Dr. Jerome Jaffe, Proposals relating to the appropriate use of methadone as an addiction treatment were included in the Nixon administration's initiative on drug abuse. This initiative established stringent regulations regarding eligibility for treatment, dosage to be administered, level of counseling, length of treatment, and criteria for take-home dosing. To prevent abuse and diversion of methadone, the subsequently promulgated regulations created a closed system that allowed treatment only through specialty clinics and according to Dr. Jaffe, the drafters of the regulations did not intend for medication dispensing to be forever limited to a few large clinics. Although they recognized that access to treatment by individual physicians might be temporarily limited, they believed that the regulations would be revised as knowledge expanded and as opioid maintenance treatment became less controversial. Sadly, this was not the case. Those temporary regulations remained and have been significantly expanded over the subsequent 30 years. We learned in the 1960s that treatment could be effective. However, because of the general portrayal of patients addicted to opiates as miscreants, treatment was confined to a small number of specialty clinics, generally located in larger metropolitan areas and controlled by stringent regulations. This depiction of patients generally led communities to resist allowing treatment programs to locate in any but the least desirable areas. Physicians were reluctant to treat addicted patients because of the public perception of these patients, the treatment location, and the complexity of the regulations. Consequently, a non-physician-oriented treatment system began to develop. Addicted patients became clients of programs that eventually developed a fortress mentality. Because treatment moved further away from the mainstream practice of medicine, and more and more clients were seen by counselors and advisors instead of patients seen by physicians, more and more regulations were needed to assure that appropriate treatment protocols were followed. Treatment programs became increasingly insular under a maze of complicated rules, further distancing physicians and the healthcare community from the care of these patients. Meanwhile, the research community led by NIDA was making inroads into new treatment methods, pharmaceutical products, and improvement in the treatment of co-occurring diseases. These developments led to new products, new uses for old products, and new approaches to the treatment for this chronic relapsing brain disease. It is essential that federal policy now ensure that these new emerging developments be transferred to the practice of medicine 
as quickly and as responsibly as possible so that more patients will have access to treatment. Nearly six million Americans affected by this disease remain untreated. This untreated population continues to impose a significant burden on both the criminal justice system and the public health system. Both NIDA and CSAT have recognized this treatment gap and are working toward closing it. These efforts are commendable, but the executive branch is constrained by legislative requirements, constrained by mandates and restraints, constrained by the patchwork of federal and state regulations, which has grown so complex that very few physicians are willing to begin treating patients because of the infrastructure required by the rules. In a sense, over time, we've created a monopolistic system which has arisen from the complex regulatory environment which now discourages new treatment providers from entering the field. We are discouraging treatment with ever more burdensome monopoly building regulation. Congress recognized this problem and enacted the Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000, which for the first time in over 80 years provides an opportunity for qualified physicians to treat addicted patients in their own office or clinic setting. While this legislation was a major step in bringing the treatment of addiction closer to the practice of medicine, and your bill, Mr. Chairman, will correct some of the oversights of data, we are clearly not at the end of the road. There are crucial next steps, not the least of which is the daunting task of encouraging and enabling five million Americans to seek and receive treatment for their disease. Data began the process of destigmatization and its treatment, but it did not end that process. This committee can help ensure that policies, priorities, and fundings are all conducive to the effective treatment. Perhaps it's time for a re-examination of existing treatment policies and their consequential regulatory requirements which discourage adequate treatment. NIDA and the Institute of Medicine have the ability and access to the expertise to provide recommendation for sorely needed policy and regulatory change which they lack authority and incentive, which they lack authority and incentive to create, to, to make. The public health as well as this committee would be well served by seeking their advice on legislation designed to remove existing impediments to effective treatment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next witness is the Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson, Executive Director of the National Drug Court Institute in Alexandria. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to represent the National Drug Court Institute and address this very important issue. Dr. McClellan has already talked about the importance of measuring client outcomes during the course of treatment when it is still possible to alter the treatment plan for the client's benefit. I will not du duplicate his discussion except to underscore my agreement that traditional approaches of measuring pre to post changes in client functioning have unfairly obscured the true effects of drug treatment services because they assess outcomes after treatment has been withdrawn from what is a chronic and relapsing condition. Although it is the position of our organization that these and other observations heard here today are applicable to treatment in all contexts, I will frame my conversation in the context of our findings in the drug court arena. Drug courts are a unique blend of treatment, case management, intense supervision, and support services along with judicial case processing. The success or failure of participants in recovery depends heavily on their access to quality, effective treatment in drug court. There are a number of indicators that can be reviewed to determine whether treatment is effective in drug court. The first is the rate at which offenders report to treatment pursuant to a court order and the length of stay and the rate of completion once they arrive. Next is the offender's abstinence from the use of alcohol and other drugs. Each drug court is required to monitor abstinence through regular, random, and observed drug testing. This means that most participants are tested at least two to three times a week. 
Another measure of the effectiveness of treatment in the drug court context is the ability of the offender to comply with other aspects of the drug court program. Is the person actively engaged in community service? Are they actively involved in job search, vocational training, or school? Are they attending self-help meetings? Are they appearing as ordered for court-reviewed hearings and meetings with probation officers and other court staff? Are they paying their fines and fees? Another factor that may assist in the determination of whether treatment is effective is the status of the offender's personal relationships during the drug court program. Is there a spouse, significant other, parent, or child who regularly accompanies the offender to court, probation, and counseling sessions? How successful is the participant in improving their living conditions as indicated by living most of the time in their own apartment or house with their families, with someone else's apartment, room, or house, or in sober housing? The measures discussed above address our evaluation of treatment while an offender is actively involved in the court process. Another related measure is the completion of educational or vocational programs in elevation and job status after treatment. One of the most important factors to the success or failure of drug courts and treatment is the individual's decrease in criminal involvement or activity. That is measured generally by recidivism. While all of the factors discussed above are important, some are easier to measure than others. It's relatively simple to maintain and compile statistics with drug testing. It's easy to review whether a person reports for treatment or engages in treatment. In looking at the more challenging measures, you must ask, how do you gauge the equality of relationships? How do you look at the number of trips a family member takes to court? In conclusion, there are a number of considerations that must be made in an effort to standardize measurements to achieve more effective treatment research. First, it's important to take any measurement at three key points in time, before, during, and after treatment whenever possible. There is an inherent challenge involved in measuring indicators prior to treatment because there will be a need to rely heavily on self-reporting. I've detailed the other points and measures in my testimony. In concluding, I would recommend that this committee call for the development and adoption of a core of validated data set to be captured in all federally funded evaluation and research studies to drug abuse treatment. I would also recommend that this, this committee put its weight behind the adoption and enforcement of best practice standards for drug treatment programs with suitable performance benchmarks that programs must meet in order to establish that they are providing evidence-based interventions with appropriate and documented treatment integrity. National organizations such as NADCP are ideally suited to review the research to establish performance benchmarks and to promulgate suitable standards for their respective disciplines. Thank you. Well, I need to correct the record or something because I was trying to sort out, and it was in the footnotes to your testimony, is I was very confused when I read this executive director, Alexandria, Virginia, because I'm saying, I think she was attorney general of Indiana uh, and, and uh, uh, the governor's uh, drug commission. So first off, uh, you're one of us, not part of this Washington group here, and I want to welcome you as a fellow, fellow Hoosier. Uh, I should have caught that earlier in my uh, uh, introduction of you. Thank you, Thank Mr. you very Chairman. much for coming. Uh, Dr. Jaffe is professor at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Thank, Thank you for coming. Thank Apparently, you. could you elaborate? Uh, we'll, I'll allow the time. Did I understand to say you were our first drug czar under right. Nixon? I've, I've been called that, Mr. Chairman, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I thank you for inviting me to speak to you on measuring the effectiveness of treatment. In January, joined together a project of Boston University School of Public Health released a report titled, Rewarding Results, Improving the Quality of Treatment for People with Alcohol and Drug Problems, 
I had the privilege of chairing the panel that produced the report. I will offer some highlights of the report here and will submit my in the entire report for use by the subcommittee. First, some preliminary thoughts on evaluation. First, how one evaluates or measures the effectiveness of treatment programs depends very much on the purpose for undertaking the evaluation. For example, an employer who wants to know if a program covered by the company's insurance plan is effective may be interested in knowing not only whether or not the problem uh, drug or alcohol use has stopped, but also how soon the employer employee can return to work. Another agency may be more interested in knowing if treatment has resulted in decreased criminal activity. Depending on resources and goals, one can obtain information directly uh, by finding and interviewing patients or indirectly by analyzing databases. It's also possible to look at surrogate measures of outcome, measures that correlate highly with good outcome, such as retention and treatment. Federal agencies have put out a number of guidelines that have properly implemented can improve the overall quality of treatment. But guidelines aimed at improving quality are unlikely in and of themselves to do the job. They cannot compel high quality treatment. Crucial to high quality treatment is a well-trained workforce, as well as better application of findings that have emerged and will continue to emerge from research. But in the real world of treatment, where there are about 12,000 programs, two major problems impede the implementation of those guidelines. First, many programs are quite small, and many, even large ones, lack the financial resources to put guidelines into practice. Second, because the job is stressful and salaries are low, there's a high turnover of personnel, not only among first-line drug counselors and clinicians, but also among program supervisors and managers. With, su with such turnover, much of the investment that programs make in clinical and management training is lost. The Joint to Together panel concluded that unless there are clear and continuing incentives to provide quality treatment, quality will always take second place to program survival or expansion. What is needed to drive quality improvement is a commitment by those who pay for treatment to reward good outcome. In other words, reward results. Again, depending, the results can vary. Merely publicizing uh, results uh, can have the effect of stimulating pride in the better programs and stimulating uh, a sense of urgency in the less effective ones. You can make the rewards more tangible by paying more to the better programs or directing more patients to those <coughs> programs. Implementing systems that look at outcomes uh, will require additional resources. These should not be carved from what is now available for treatment. <coughs> Rewarding results should not be seen as a means, uh, should be seen as a means to improve outcome. It is not a pathway to getting more treatment for less money. The Join Together panel recommends that rewarding results be defined as a national goal. On the road to reaching that goal, there are many technical and political obstacles to be overcome. And many different groups will have to be persuaded that it can be done and should be done. I thank you for your time and would be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next witness is uh, Catherine Martin, Senior Vice President of Second Genesis in Silver Spring, Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Cummings. Um, as Chairman said, my name is Kathy Martins and I'm the Executive Director of Second Genesis and a member of the Board of Directors of the Therapeutic Communities of America. As a provider, Second Genesis appreci appreciates the opportunity to provide the committee with our written testimony about the measuring the effectiveness of drug treatment. Second Genesis is the oldest therapeutic community-based substance provider in the Mid-Atlantic region and Maryland's largest provider, Congressman Cummings. As a successful nonprofit for over 35 years, we continue to serve the substance abuse populations in Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. We have criminal justice programs, we have programs for women and their children, and a highly respected integrated program for clients with co-occurring disorders. Society cannot continue to pay for the individuals who unsuccessfully cycle through various treatment options and criminal justice systems. 
in the Outlook and Outcomes 2002 Annual Report for Maryland, an untreated substance abuser on the street cost society an estimated $43,300 a year. An incarcerated substance abuser costs $39,600 a year. In contrast, eight months of residential treatment at Second Genesis costs only $17,280. And for the remaining four months of the year and beyond, the recovering taxpayer is a productive member of society and a taxpayer. Second Genesis clinical professionals have determined that the shorter the stay of the client, the more likely that client is to relapse. Our own data collection demonstrates that six months after leaving residential treatment, 70% of long-term clients reported no alcohol or other drug use in the 30 days prior to that survey. The overall success rate of our program is 63%, significantly higher than that of the Maryland statewide average of 47% for similar clients. As a provider, we are largely publicly funded which requires us to report our government contract officers, foundations, and other sources of funding proof that the dollars that they have invested with us have produced concrete results. We use the HATS reporting protocol to report regularly and electronically to data collection systems for our contractors. The majority of this information is in actual real time. We collect information from our clients at admission, halfway through treatment, at discharge and 90 days post-treatment. However, in order to provide this outcome information, the burden of reporting has grown enormously. We are also responsible for staff training and other increasing costs associated with this outcome-based data collection. Second Genesis has approximately 40 counselors that spend a minimum of 10% of their job completing outcome-related paperwork. This number does not include all the other paperwork that must be completed for each client. It is becoming increasingly burdensome to dedicate staff hours and training to outcome and data collection at the expense of direct client treatment. We are mandated to maintain this data to prove program effectiveness. Additionally, Second Genesis employs three full-time individuals who manage all aspects of this data collection and its analysis. However, funding to comply with federal and other contractual mandates has not followed suit. We collect information on all of the SAMHSA seven domains, yet it's the analysis of this data that is truly important. In summary, substance abuse treatment programs should be cr constructed on and funded on evidence-based methodologies that are outcome-based and meet appropriate performance standards. According to Therapeutic Communities of America, any outcome measure should have the following considerations. Addicted individuals must be placed in the appropriate level, type, and standard of care to achieve positive and quality results. According to the NIDA Research Report Therapeutic Community, for individuals with many serious problems, research again suggests outcomes were better for those who received TC treatment for 90 days or more. Treatment and any other performance standards must be client-based and should flow as a function of the client necessitating a coordinated and comprehensive continuum of care for that client. Any measure or performance standard should recognize that different treatment methodologies should reflect the time frame from which favorable impact outcomes are likely to occur. This consideration also includes modifications to treatment when necessary in working with special populations. Any measure should recognize therapeutic community residential programs and permit at least eight to 12 months of continuous treatment. Outcomes and measures should be no different in application to addicted individuals than any other chronic disease. Realistic goals for specific substance abuse populations should be established. In the case of substance abuse, unlike any other illness, our system is often in danger of under-treating the client. No federal or state measurement or performance standard should be mandated without providing necessary direct funding, technical assistance, and capacity building to the service providers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I would welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Our final witness today is Dr. Henry? Andre. Andre. 
sorry, silent H. Andre Jones, a research director for the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy in Baltimore, Maryland. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and a special hello to Ranking Member Elijah Cummings, who represents the patients and families in Baltimore City, where Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, Center for Addiction and Pregnancy is located. And thank you very much for inviting me to testify. I serve as the Director of Research for the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy, which I'll refer to as CAP, that's located at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. And I am also a NIDA-funded researcher focused on drug treatment effectiveness. Additionally, my program is a Maryland Addiction Directors Council and State Associations on Addiction Services member, which is a national organization of state and alcohol drug abuse treatment associations and prevention provider associations, whose mission it is to ensure the accessibility and accountability of quality drug, alcohol treatment, and prevention services. I have spent a lot of time thinking about how to expand and improve drug treatment effectiveness. And obviously, we need to close the tremendous treatment gap. We also need to invest in the best treatment options, ensuring that our science makes it onto the streets and makes it onto ev into everyday practice. CAP's outcomes actually demonstrate that drug and alcohol treatment can be effective. And I want to share some of our latest successes with you. 75% of the women who are enrolled in CAP have drug-free deliveries and are drug-free three months after completing our treatment program. 81% of our children have drug-free deliveries or drug-free at delivery. 70% of our women maintain custody of their children. 15% of our women actually decrease dependency on welfare. And 95% of our women actually remain HIV negative while in treatment. Our average cat baby is born at a normal time, at a very healthy birth weight, with normal alertness. Investing in CAP treatment can actually save $12,000 per infant through re a reduction in the neonatal intensive care unit stays. CAP successes are actually typical of many treatment programs across the country that treat women with children. CAP, and let me tell you a little bit about how we've actually been able to achieve those outcomes. CAP was founded in 1991, and it's an outpatient as well as residential treatment program. And we have a number of ancillary su support services, including the drug abuse treatment that we provide. We provide transportation to and from the program. We have on-site OBGYN care. We have on-site pediatric care. We also have on-site child care for women attending the outpatient treatment. And we have intensive outreach services. So if a client doesn't show up to treatment, we're out there on the streets looking for the patient to bring her back in. And it is these ancillary support services that help us achieve our outcomes. There are other recommendations I have for improving the quality of treatment services. The ability to conduct studies and actually measure outcomes will improve the quality of treatment. CAP has been able to conduct these studies because we've been funded by NIDA, and we've been able to look at specific treatment um, interventions, and this information has actually informed our practice and improved it. Transferring science to service also improves the quality of care. And what we've learned from studies, we need to be able to implement into, into a first-line, front-line provider service. Without the technology that was discussed um, by Dr. Volkow, including the Clinical Trials Network and SAMHSA's Addiction Technology Transfer Centers, the addiction treatment field will be much slower to accept these new technologies. We also need to be funding new techniques, including emerging medications, as well as medications and behavioral interventions to put the best practice into place. We need to be able to recruit and retain qualified addiction treatment workforce. The development of coursework in medical and nursing schools is key to encourage practice, practitioners to recognize drug dependence or abuse, as well as to um, know where to give, provide or referrals to those patients to treat them. We also need to not forget our um, recovering community who has long been the frontline providers in this treatment. Finally, we, it would be good to develop loan forgiveness programs or repayment programs in order to facilitate people to stay in this typically low-paying field. Funding access to the full continuum of care will certainly help improve treatment quality. Patients are often not able to go from one level of care to the next, and CAT patients are certainly not an exception to this barrier. Funding the full continuum of treatment is often very difficult for different jurisdictions. And given the pressure on the limited amount of funds that we have, as well as the limitations that exist on current funding mechanisms like Medicaid, if we were to increase the fiscal year 2005 substance abuse prevention and treatment block grants, access to recovery programs, and target capacity expansion programs, we could help meet the pressing needs for treatment. Additionally, better Medicaid coverage would also improve treatment for women with children. We need to be moving towards a system of uniform treatment outcome measures across funding streams to help improve treatment quality. Moving towards this system of uniform performance measures across federal funding streams will help 
benefit providers for reducing the large paperwork demands that are increasing and help us be able to more clearly re react to um, the different types of outcomes that are demanded by potentially different providers. These savings could hopefully help us reinvest in provider training and back into treatment. When SAMHSA determines the selective performance outcome measures, I hope that they will also consult with the providers as well as just the states, since outcome data is first and foremost generated at a provider level. Thank you very much for holding this hearing today and for highlighting the importance of drug and alcohol treatment. My patients, the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy staff, and I applaud you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. I'm going to confer with Mr. Cummings for a second. We have three votes. Uh, we have approximately seven minutes left in the first vote. Uh, are all of you able to stay for a little bit uh, longer? Nobody's got a plane or anything. So we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go vote. It'll probably be about 20 minutes till we get back, unless we have to hold a vote open for a while. Subcommittee stands recess. get restarted. Subcommittee will come back to order. I want to thank each of you for your testimony and each of you for your years of, of work. Um, I ha want to start with two different categories. So let me start first with uh, uh, Dr. Jaffe and I believe Mr. O'Keefe both talked about, in fact, I think you referred to Dr. Jaffe with it, about how to put some incentives into the system for behavior. I don't know whether Dr. McClellan referred to that too. Now, could you describe a little more? Uh, you said it wouldn't believe it was uh, Mr. O'Keefe, was it you who said regulations alone wouldn't do it? We need to have incentives. And Dr. Jaffe referred to incentives as well. What exactly do you mean by incentives? Are you saying uh, that you can't? be eligible for certain programs unless you do this, that there would be a bonus if you do certain behavior things like longer stays, uh, different types of things. And if we gave those, would it give an incentive to programs to cherry pick more? In other words, take the easiest to treat as opposed to the hardest to treat. Uh, when you put incentives in for producing results, you always run the risk that those who are trying to get results will pick the easiest cases. This is true in medicine in general. It's probably true of life in general. Uh, and one has to uh, develop the methodology. That there's some in place, it's just not perfected yet, of adjusting for how difficult the initial cases are so that you can fairly compare practitioners or programs in terms of what they've achieved. And uh, that's the one area where one, where really carefully comparing programs uh, will need further investment to really make that a fair process. Uh, when you ask about what incentives you can have, the incentives can vary. They can vary from just posting the scores of programs in a city. Uh, that can appeal to pride. It can appeal to the, the, the consumers, the people who are seeking treatment. They can vote with their feet. If you rank the hospitals in terms of their mortality rates for bypass surgery, you quickly find that people seek treatment at the hospitals that have the lowest mortality rates. <laughs> so you don't have to necessarily pay more, but clearly the, the providers, I mean the, the payers, whether it's the government 
or insurance plans or employers could begin to say, we pay more for better outcomes. The net effect of that is that those programs that get bad outcomes get paid less. And ultimately, they're either going to have to merge with more effective programs or go out of business. That's what happens to any organization that delivers a, a less than adequate product. Uh, the real question there, however, is whether or not at the state level uh, there will be the political will to stop paying for a particular program. Programs often develop their own uh, political support. Uh, they are not without allies. And you know the, the, the bureaucrat that tries to say, we're not going to pay you anymore because you're substantially below standard may find that he has a very short tenure in the bureaucracy. Uh, I say that having been on all sides of this issue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody else has a comment on it, but I also ask uh, Ms. Uh, Freeman Wilson, could you comment a little bit on that? Uh, coming out of the Gary area uh, where uh, in the region there are success stories and, and not success stories, but uh, certainly Gary itself, uh, uh, to some degree East Chicago, have just overwhelming challenges. Uh, we're going through the very thing that Dr. Jaffe just talked about in education. Uh, wh what do you do when a school system is relatively disorganized and how do you get the political will and what if the treatment programs were concentrated in that area and somebody didn't see uh, how to do that? Yet fundamentally there's uh, basic truths in trying to address the question because we've been funding some programs uh, of which we all kind of are familiar with are less effective than other programs, but they have a bureaucratic momentum and a size and a number of, of people who've been through a comfortability with the insurance or connections. How, how do we put this kind of accountability in and yet address the difficult questions that would be, for example, in Northwest Indiana? Well, you know, I, I think that um, there, are two, the mic there are two examples in the Gary area that um, really speak to Dr. Jaffe's point and um, I think what we need to do. And they are the Safe and Drug Free Schools program and the second is the drug court there because what happened with both of those programs is that they did evidence some success and that success was proven through um, a very clear evaluation process one that was not only given to the uh, participants and, and those who ran the programs, but those who also funded the programs both at the federal level, at the state level, and then ultimately the local level because the local uh, officials, city and, and, and uh, county officials were looked to to pick up the funding, particularly for the drug court program, and they were willing to pick it up because it showed a reduction in recidivism, it showed uh, more sustained treatment, and it also showed uh, that after a year and after two years that there was still a sustained reduction in recidivism. The challenge in both the Safe and Drug Free Schools program in the Gary City Drug Court and in other drug courts in the region has been the consistency of their treatment. I think that the numbers that were posted in Gary were there because of not necessarily the treatment, although the treatment was helpful, but also the use of non-conventional programs and um, self-help support groups like NA, like AA, and like uh, the um, presence of the Salvation Army program. So, when the panelists here talk about the importance of treatment, I think that, um, and, and the challenges that you cited uh, in the Northwest Indiana region, I think that those are very, very evident if you look at uh, the type of treatment that is important to advance the cost forward. Ms. Martins, uh, what's your reaction as a provider to posting results uh, everybody could see uh, putting some form of accountability. How would you adjust that? What ways would we, how would we do this so that you didn't have incentives to kind of game the system to some degree? In the state of Maryland, um, 
Congressman Souter, it, that is already being done. I mean, it is. Okay. It, we're talking real time outcomes, and actually, we just got an RFP yesterday. So if I had if I had a, a cousin who I wanted to send, I could look at the different treatment centers and have some sort of a common comparison across? Not really, because there's no treatment on demand in Maryland. If you're not in the criminal justice system, you're probably no, but let's not. Let's say I wanted to pay for it. Um, if you wanted to pay for it, yes, you could find that. And I would liken it kind of to the charter school um, initiatives, where really the efficacy of what you do is, as, as Dr. Jaffe said, you're not going to choose the school for your child that has the greatest failure rate in the city or the state. One of the things I was going to mention to you that Maryland is doing, which I, and I really commend the state for doing this, is you have benchmarks to get paid for your client. So you get paid a little bit at the beginning, and as that client goes through treatment and successfully completes, there's almost a balloon payment in the end for your efficacy with that client. So you're really being paid for your outcomes with each individual client, which is a very interesting way for the state to get what they pay for. I know Director Walters testified in front of this committee on the, uh, when we first uh, began to look at their how they were going to tackle uh, the treatment initiative, and he was proposing to do that at the federal level. Dr. McCullen, you said that you felt that some of our measurements weren't adapting for outpatient as opposed to inpatient. How, what's your reaction to what they've proposed there and what Maryland's doing? You'll never get the kind of thing that Dr. Jaffe and uh, Judge Wilson are talking about if you do post-treatment only evaluation. Um, if you evaluated first grade schools in the state of Maryland by the number of people who graduated from high school or college, you'd never figure out what was the best thing to do in first grade to, to make that happen. The kind of model that Judge uh, uh, Wilson is talking about is much more iterative and proactive. Feedback occurs week to week to week. And just as in a, in a medical condition, um, blood pressure is a clinical measure. It's also an outcome. So you don't have somebody coming in from the outside taking the blood pressure. They take the blood pressure me measure because it's both an outcome and it's a point that gives you decisions for the next thing that you do. If the, if the blood pressure doesn't go down, you change. So um, I, I think that's what I'm talking about. You need the kind of immediate feedback, especially since 90% of your treatment is in an outpatient setting those individuals, 60% of whom are coming from the criminal justice system, they're not away someplace in a program. They're in the community. So immediately you want to know what's the urine test? Are they getting employed? Are they go getting a job training? Are they hooking up with an AA sponsor? All, all the things uh, uh, Judge Wilson talked about. And it's possible to do. Now let me ask, uh, kind of leads to my other big category of, of uh, questions. And um, one of the more interesting things that happened back when I was a, a staffer um, was uh, in the, uh, this must have been in the late 80s, a number of my conservative Republican friends all of a sudden found themselves in administration. And one of our principles was, well, we ought to block grant things. We as conservatives believe we shouldn't have uh, so much control, so many regulations. We heard Ms. Martin say that the paperwork was becoming burdensome, that they were having to have all these different people instead of actually being practitioners and so on. And then uh, as we held an oversight hearing on why they, that all of a sudden my conservative friends were having so many of these regulations, uh, their comeback was, well, the other conservative variable is accountability, which we've been hearing about on the same panel, talking about too many regulations. By the way, we need more measurements. Uh, we need more flexibility to treat the patients. Our dollars aren't increasing as fast as the demands. But by the way, we need actually more information. You're suggesting a very comprehensive evaluation type of, of uh, approach. Um, and uh, part of the reason I remember uh, Becky Norton Dunlop, who was at the Justice Department at that time, said, 
what we found out was when we didn't require all this type of thing, that most people were honest, but a bunch of people started ripping us off. And our theft and fraud rate right, went up so dramatically that uh, it was more expensive than the paperwork burden. And furthermore, the public wouldn't support uh, this type of effort if they, when they hear these cases that uh, we're having some of this in, in uh, that's dogging Medicaid or the food stamps program where you find some person who they get on 60 Minutes or 2020 and this person's been ripping off the federal government for this amount of money. So the next thing we put a whole bunch of regulations on for everybody in the system, uh, how, how would you suggest we do this because we want to make sure our dollars are effective. There isn't a member of Congress or anybody who doesn't go out in the street and hear, well, man, everybody I know who's on drugs has been through multiple treatment programs, so we go through this effectiveness thing, and then we put a whole bunch of requirements on. Um, how would you address this dilemma? Some suggestions. Yeah, just, just to start it, I'm certainly not the expert here, but there's a very big difference between paperwork, which everybody in this place will tell you is overwhelming. Uh, for example, in Philadelphia, it takes three to four hours worth of paperwork to get somebody into treatment. It's, and, and it's paperwork, meaning that it's stuff that you fill out that you have no use for. I'm not talking about that, and I don't think anybody here is either. I'm talking about as a regular part of the treatment process, the counselors, the, the people who are working with the team are measuring whether they're going to work whether they're still using drugs, what, all clinical, just like the blood pressure. The blood pressure isn't paperwork in a, in a hypertension clinic. It's critical. You gotta know what's going on so that you can make an adjustment. That's, I think, the point, uh, Doctor, or Mr., I can't, I'm, you're, 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 Dr. I'm always in a, a, a medical environment, so uh, <laughs> everybody's a doctor. Judge Wilson keeps making, to, to use information to make decisions. That's not paperwork, <clears throat> and it shouldn't be burdensome. Any other comments on that? I mean, in other words, if we could separate out, these are the absolutely critical things for medical reasons for drug treatment, and these are things that we might need for tracking for financial reasons or insurance companies. One last, last question. Do you want to say something? Dr. McClellan's absolutely right, Congressman. You know, the day-to-day -day paperwork that we do, because treatment is holistic. The doctor's absolutely correct. I need to know what your drug test was yesterday. How's your family visit? Are you getting your GED? Those are very important <laughs> things. It's, and that was always part of treatment. It's all of these other things that are now layered onto it that just take so much time that it really takes away from direct client treatment. I, I, I will say, I mean, you've helped clarify that here are the things that you need there, and then there are other things we need for waste and fraud reasons, which you may refer to as paperwork. But quite frankly, I sat, I believe it was actually in this committee room, when Chris Shays headed the Human Services Subcommittee in my first term, I was vice chair on a Medicaid fraud case. And the hardest clients to serve are those who have no insurance, have no immediate family, uh, and have some chronic condition and have moved around. We have a place in Fort Wayne, the Byron Health Center, that has a lot of these patients. And we, had, we were asking the GAO and the Inspector General, and we had HHS here, why they hadn't terminated this one company that had been found in court of defrauding the federal government of a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And a billion dollars of defrauding the federal government. And they were in multiple regions of the country, and our computers hadn't caught them under different, different names. But what we found, the reason HHS hadn't uh, terminated them was because something like 20% of these highest risk people who nobody else would take, no nursing home would take, uh, the state government really couldn't do it, or they had to have a place to put the people, um, nobody would take them. So we were having this company that was bilking because they claimed the reimbursement wasn't enough, probably true, uh, to cover the cost of it, so they started doing it, that type of thing. And part of the reason we have the paperwork side for addresses, information, for tracking, is that, but we need, what we need to do is separate here, is the paperwork really necessary for that part, and then what parts are medically necessary for drug treatment. And that's been uh, very helpful for me for clarification as we kind of tackle that uh, question. I'll yield to Mr. Cummings. I think I have one or two more. Thank you very much, Chairman. I want to thank all of you for your testimony. 
Uh, one of the things that, uh, and listen to the chairman, I, I, uh, you know, I see all the money that we spend on in government, and I hear uh, the complaints from constituents when we spend money on certain things, and then we don't spend money on other things. Um, I really want to have some sympathy with regard to the paperwork. I really, really, really want to, but it's very difficult. Um, I see taxpayers' hard-earned dollars being paid to treatment facilities, doing a great job, by the way. But I also think that uh, with those dollars come a certain level of accountability. And I know you're talking about two separate things. I, I heard you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure where the divide actually comes. But I want to go to you. Dr. McLeon, one of the things that you talked about, and it's, it's a very interesting um, viewpoint, and I, and I really think we are, I think that when the public watches this, they would be almost shocked, although I agree with you, hmm. that um, winning here is not necessarily getting somebody off of drugs forever. And I think we still have to educate the public to understand that. Because I think a lot of times the public sees a person on drugs, uh, like a lady I saw in my neighborhood just the other day, who they once knew as a bright high school student, and now they see him sitting on some steps, dirty, nodding, looking quite, uh, you know, yeah. out of it. And they say to themselves, you know, okay, I want to do something for that person. But if you told them that, that them um, reducing, reducing the amount of drugs they use, um, perhaps getting a job, perhaps uh, coming up with uh, having re good relationships with family and a support system could be part of the measurement of success. I think the general public couldn't fully understand that and comprehend it because they want to see that person the way they saw them in high school when they were on the uh, with the cheerleaders. So I think we do have to educate the public about all the kind of measurements that you all talked about. And I think that because the public wants, again, to see the dollar spent effectively and efficiently. And so it doesn't necessarily equal effective, effective and efficient spend, spending of dollars when they hear those kind of measurements. And so um, I'm just wondering, I mean, you've heard all of your, all the fellow witnesses up here talk. I mean, you agree that are there any measurements that you that have been left out? Anybody that you know that you didn't hear? In other words, you talk about measuring tools, the things that you need to measure success. Have you heard of anything that has been left out that should be considered when measuring success? Because one of my concerns is, and I know we've got a lot of great treatment providers, but one of my greatest concerns are the young people who come. I live in one of the, in a district that has probably some of the highest addiction in the country. And I talk to recovering addicts, and a lot of them will tell me that they've gone to certain programs that they knew, they found out from going through them, and, 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 and by the way, it gets out on the street which programs are, quote, real, unquote, and which ones are not. And they tell me that if they go to an unreal program, it can do more harm than good, but yet and still our federal dollars are being spent. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do we, how, how do we um, make sure that we, it's gonna, it may take time to kind of uh, sift away the fair programs and get the better ones out there so that people can have effective treatment. And I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how do we do that? How do you all, do you all have any suggestions? Are you following me? I can give you, I can give you an example 
of a, I urge you to, to look at it. It's precisely the kind of program that Dr. Jaffe is talking about, and that's the state of Delaware. Now, it's a small state, and it's a very interconnected state. But they basically gave up. They said, look, we don't know a single thing to tell you what to do, but we know what we want. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put criteria into play so that I'll, I'll summarize very quickly. You open, as a, your treatment programs, you open your doors, you will get 80% of your contract for last year. However, if you meet the following criteria, you can make as much as 120% of your contract last year. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll I just summarize and tell you that several programs weren't able to do it. They closed, new places came in, and they were able to do it, and they're functioning now. And what the, what the state is doing is they're adding criteria. They started with retention, because it was the easiest to measure, all the programs agreed with it, and, they, they, and that knocked out several programs. Now they're moving towards no new arrests. And if they're successful, they've got a commitment from the Justice Department to put additional money into the treatment side, because it's worth it. It's mm -hmm. worth it to the Justice Department, but only if they're able to, to make those, if they can buy success, mm -hmm. in other words. Yeah. Now, you all, anybody, does anybody else have something? Now, you all heard the uh, testimony of the other two witnesses earlier, and you heard my questions with regard to jobs. Um, and it seems as if in most states, um, People are placed in a position, if they get a, particularly if they get a conviction, where they are locked out of so many jobs. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you all, I mean, when you're trying to help somebody move forward, um, you know, there, there are a lot of barbers in Baltimore who used to have, I don't know why barber, bar, it's a, such a big deal, but I met so many barbers who have had drug problems. Um, so apparently that's one field that is still open, and these and 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 they, and the reason why you get to know them is because they talk about it. Why in the they, barber shop? They also teach barbering in jail. Jail. And see that I'm, that's that's a good. Uh, I'm glad you uh, threw that in. That's right. But if that person came out of prison, and there was a a law that said if you have say a drug conviction or you had drug problems or whatever, that you can't be a barber, then that person's then precluded from, from making an income. And see, see, one of the problems that happens, I don't, I don't know whether people think about this, if people have fines and child support, and believe me, I think people ought to pay child support, that's very important. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that go against a person and basically forces them back e either into jail or, to, or to, to addiction. Some kind of way, we had to grapple with that. And, and um, Judge Judge Wilson, I mean, in courts, I'm sure you see that. You know, a guy comes in or a lady comes in and says, look, Judge, I'm doing the best I can. But I can't get a job. And if I don't get a job, you're going to send me back to jail or, you know, I, the reason why I went back to being involved in drugs was so that I could address making sure I make my pay my fines, pay my child support, pay whatever I've got to pay, and so and so even more so, a job becomes very significant. Am I right? That's exactly right, uh, Congressman Cummins. Uh, and there are two things that we look at. One is. The, when we talk to people about how they develop their court programs, we always encourage pre-plea programs. Because if you have a plea pre-plea pre, pre program and you successfully complete it, then you're not saddled with the conviction. But then as we move towards a discussion of re-entry uh, nationally, then we have to look at how the laws in the states affect the ability of the reentry participants to reenter society and become effective members of society. And so our organization, along with a number of organizations, have embarked upon surveys of state laws, but not just to survey those laws, but to look at ways to encourage legislators to begin to move those laws away from being punitive, because if, in fact, 
you expect a person to reenter society, become a taxpaying citizen, how do you saddle them with a conviction? Now, there are, don't get me wrong, there are some folks who need to have convictions on their records. We need to know, we need that red flag on those records. But in many instances, it is not, in the ca it is not appropriate in the case of those individuals who have uh, convictions for possession of drugs, for other property-related crimes, one-time convictions, so that we need to look at ways to have our laws in the states and to encourage the states to develop those laws in a way that you don't saddle the folks the first time around so that they can come out and get jobs and pay support and pay taxes and pay all of those things that evidence them as members of societies who are productive. Yes. I'd like to just add something on a much more kind of grassroots level. One of the other hats that I wear at Johns Hopkins University is overseeing an aftercare program for heroin dependent individuals who have completed a seven day or a three day inpatient detoxification and it's a six month NIDA funded aftercare program and we have four goals and one of the main goals that we have is getting that person a job. Now, a lot of our patients, of course, have criminal justice involvement. Um, and so what we, but what we found is that there are jobs available, perhaps not the best job. I mean, a lot of them are in barber shops, in donut shops, um, working construction. But what we try and do is it's a foot in the door. But what we found is that these patients are particularly scared about even getting a job. Some of them have never had a job. And working through that, um, you know, let's put a resume together. These people have never had a resume. And they actually, sitting down and filling out a questionnaire that we sit there with them and say, you know, can you come up with two people who could vouch for you? Sometimes they will remember, oh yeah, I, you know, I did that in the past. I, that was pretty good. I have a good contact here. And then the next step, after they've filled out their resume, is interview, practicing interviewing skills. And we do it videotape so they can actually see what they look like, learn how to answer questions. And then we take them out and we have what we call job fairs. And we go to places that have hired our patients previously. So what we're doing is we're trying to build in small successes and maximize the opportunity of the likelihood for them getting a position. And we do, I mean, 39% of our patients are actually employed, and a lot of them have criminal justice involvement. So it is possible to overcome this, but it takes a tremendous amount of, quote unquote, hand-holding and working through those steps to give them success. Dr. Jones raises an important point, and that is to engage the participation of the business community in this dialogue. Because we can talk all the time about people needing jobs, but there are people who give jobs, and unless they believe that someone coming out of her program or someone coming out of a drug court or out of a therapeutic community is a good employment risk, and I would argue that they are better because you know more likely than not that those folks are drug free. Whereas those who aren't being tested, who aren't in treatment, you don't have that guarantee, but we have to engage the chambers of commerce. We have to engage state government. We have to engage the other larger employments, be there hospitals, uh, manufacturers, in that uh, conversation about employing not only the individuals who look good on a resume, but those whose resumes may be a little blemished. Just one last question. Um, I remember when I first started practicing law, one of the things I wanted to do was to see exactly how these 12-step uh, uh, programs worked. And I was just fascinated by the fact that when I went just to see how they worked, you had these people sitting around talking all their business. You know, it was interesting. <laughs> and, uh, it's called sharing. Sharing, yes. sharing, sharing. okay. <laughs> that does sound a little bit more clinical. Yeah, yeah. yeah sharing. <laughs> and uh, I, I just wonder how important is that to the things that, to all your theories of effective drug treatment? How important is sharing? I'm just curious. It, it's not an opinion. It's the, there are studies to show it. It's very effective and it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Environments change people. So you've been to treatment programs, I, I can see that, and, and you can see the kind of environment that's there and you can accept that those people while they're there are honest and are industrious and are, have all the values you wanna see. 
when they go back out to the environment that produced the drug abuse to begin with, or in concert with their, their genetics produced that, that is very likely to change them back. Very likely, unless they are involved on a regular basis. This is what they call aftercare. This is the continuing care. Dr. Volkoff talked about it. I think everybody here has talked about it. One of the best, because it's cheap, because it's cheap baloney, it's free, it's everywhere, it's all the time, is AA, NA, these 12-step programs. Mm -hmm. We need more. The fact is only about a quarter of the people that are referred to them actually will go ahead and, and really lock up. And then you got to guarantee those people do very well. But we need alternatives. We need new kinds of things for people who don't want to do that. Smart. Congressman Cummings, what, I, I want to use one of our programs in your district as an example to you in, in all of your questions you were asking. It's one thing for us to get a mom clean and sober. It's another thing, and, and I know you can appreciate this in Baltimore, mom reads at a third grade level, does math at a second grade level. She's been getting high since she was in middle school because mom did it and grandma did it and dad's been locked up forever. Kids got so many problems. We've got him at Kennedy Krieger. So we're working on her GED while she's in treatment, case managing her to figure out what kind of skill set she'd like to do. As, as Dr. Jones was saying, it's the little things. How to go to the, to the office downtown and get your child's immunization record. That sounds easy to us. That can be mom saying, I'm going to go get high. I, I, I can't do that. I mean, the little things that we take for granted in our life that have to be case managed throughout this entire process. The mayor and I are working now. There's no place for me to put mom in a house that is not a trigger for her addiction. She remembers the noise on North Avenue. She remembers the smell. She remembers what you look like. And you're a trigger for her addiction. So if you don't treat the client holistically, and I think that's one of the reasons therapeutic communities have been so successful, because every part of the client's life, you know, mom's relationship with her boyfriend may be a trigger for her addiction. So she can't go back into that neighborhood. She can't go back and live with her family. And if we don't look at the whole picture and find jobs, education, housing, and as Dr. McClellan was saying, the 12-step support system, you can't leave a second genesis program without having a sponsor in the community and already knowing where your meetings are going to be. Where is there a meeting that you can take your kids? I mean, these are, they sound like really, really simple, but they're huge for a mom that's in a fourth or fifth generation of the addiction cycle. Well, it's interesting, and as I close, the, in Baltimore, there is an entire community of recovering addicts. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. They invited me to, 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 to speak at something. I thought it was going to be like 30 people, mm -hmm. about 700. That's right. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I realize that, um, and I guess it's like another family. Mm -hmm. So going back to what you were saying, Dr. McClellan, I guess it's a thing of, it's, again, it's a shifting. You, you don't, so you, you shift over to this family where you're doing the 12 steps, and you can make new relationships, and everybody's trying to get, well, they're, they're trying to get to recovery, or trying to be recovered. On the other hand, if they shift back into that old community, then they may be, again, as you were saying, something pulls them back in. And it could be one incident. And because I remember one time when we did a little tour and there was a woman in Baltimore who had been off of, uh, of uh, heroin for 15 years, for 15 years, had a great job, doing well, had one incident to happen in the family, and she was back on. And it was incredible to me. And she said she stopped. She had stopped going to the 12-step programs. Yeah. So the, I think the thing that we, but she's hit on something, and I think it's something that we as a committee have to look at. You know, we, we're talking about sometimes generation after generation after generation. And, the, and it's so costly to try to treat the kids and treat everybody. And so at some point, we, we, I think that's why we're so concerned about effective treatment 
because it's, like you said, this doesn't only affect the, 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 the client, it affects everybody uh, in their vicinity, and which is, which is really says a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience. I, I I'm going to, uh, I want to raise a point, see if anybody has any comment uh, with this, because one of the most explosive issues we deal with here, uh, the way we're playing it through is, is the faith-based questions. Yet what becomes pretty clear to me is, is that to expand this program's political support beyond a more traditional liberal democratic community, if you don't have the conservative faith-based community with it, there isn't enough political support. In Indiana, um, as Judge Wilson, Freeman Wilson knows full well, it gets really nasty in political campaigns if you take a position that you ought to give more flexibility for people who've come out of prison and then one of them gets arrested. Um, it gets, uh, right now we have a situation where an Indianapolis news media is, has stated that 10% of the people at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles in Indianapolis are former convicts. Well, that is partly, doesn't mean, now some of those, that was before they went to work there. There are other problems with since they've gone to work there. But that means, in fact, that they've hired people in that position. But politically, it's going to be a debatable island this fall because um, that is a high number. And it's why in a lot of federal jobs there are barriers because it's so politically explosive. And if this is just, you know, there's a big law and order type of, of mentality with it. And unless there's a way, in, including in jobs, we, that uh, part of the reason that the, we've had 16 years of Democratic governors, which I don't view as great in Indiana, but nevertheless, <laughs> they've been, they've been uh, always getting A's on the scorecards on faith-based because they much came to realize that, particularly in the minority community, but if they don't match it with suburban churches as well, we weren't going to get the support for the follow-through uh, because a employer may be making, if he's guaranteed there's drug testing, the type of decision that you referred to, which is he knows he's got a clean employee. But there are other risks. For example, a number of my friends who've hired people uh, have had reoccurring problems because not everybody is rehabbed all, all the way. One of our major uh, volunteer programs in Fort Wayne for people coming out of prison went broke because one of the people relapsed and stole everything they had. They stole their computers, they stole their the uh, uh, number of other things in the building, it's put them under, they were too marginal. Um, and that, but, but they came back, a number of those people, not because they viewed it as a business, per se, but because their faith motivated them and they felt they had an obligation. Unless we can figure out how we're gonna make some coalitioning between the, the, the prison fellowship conservative Christian people uh, to back up uh, the kind of the institutional support in, from the government, it's going to be very hard to figure out how we're going to provide this comprehensive follow-through in jobs, in the political support for adequate dollars, because when we start to split these things off, it, it's ironic that we have these uh, political divisions, and, and our distinguished judge and attorney general in Indiana knows exactly what I'm talking about, because we've had some very tough debates in Indiana and are continuing to have them on this very subject that makes it really dicey when any politician walks out there and says, we need to look for housing, we need to look for job employment, uh, we need to open up the opportunities, and then there, something occurs or there's a backlash or somebody says, what do I have to do, commit a crime to get a job because we have, uh, you know, I'm unemployed? And, and politically, we have to figure out how we're going to work this kind of stuff through because we have put more money into treatment, but it isn't at the levels where we need, and partly this is underneath it, particularly when you look at the aftercare. I'd be interested. Dr. Jaffe, you looked like you wanted to say something. Anybody else? Who well. One of the major conclusions of our panel was that if you want to get broadened public support for the resources that you need to provide treatment and good treatment for those who need it, is the public has to believe the treatment is effective. Now, it's not going to ever be perfect. There's always going to be somebody who's going to relapse even after 15 years. There's, if 99% of people who leave prison don't do anything, somebody will take a job and steal from his employer. That's a virtual guarantee. But if people are convinced that, there is, that the people who pay for treatment are looking 
at the programs and making certain that they're all competent and that the, the programs that aren't for real are being eliminated or, or at least they're not being funded with the taxpayers' dollars, they're going to be more willing to come up with those resources. So what we saw was that evaluation and rewarding the effective programs is a way to build public support as this kind of treatment competes for uh, against other priorities uh, in, in the sphere. I mean, there, there's never enough money for everything that needs to be done. And treatment needs to compete. We know that. And one of the ways it can compete more effectively is when you can talk about looking at it and knowing that all the programs are at least at some minimum standard of competence. And, and I, in the in the jobs follow through question too, that part of the the problem here is if we if we took say the targeted jobs credit, and uh, said that in the targeted jobs credit it should be those who are highest risk uh, in the society for being unemployed, and um, I bet if we looked at that, that we would find a fair percentage of those people have had a, a drug been through a drug treatment program. So theoretically, this could be turned on us saying the people who are getting the targeted jobs are the people who have committed a crime when we have high unemployment. Unless they're, what I'm trying to get here is unless we have a broader base of support that understands the concept behind this, both from a risk of crime to society but also an obligation and, and an understanding that if these people can get rehab, they're going to be better in their family lives, the kids, the struggle you talked about in the families. That, but politically, we've got a problem here, particularly if, for example, we put in the targeted jobs credit that the people who have been uh, arrested should go to the front of the line because they're the hardest to employ. Congressman Souder, I would say the way to transcend that goal is to really convince the people who you refer to of the equal opportunity nature of this problem. It doesn't matter whether you're conservative or, uh, or, or liberal. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you, what you look like. Congressman Davis talked about it earlier when he said that not only were they having problems in Chicago, but I know because we work with the drug courts in Kane County, Illinois, there's a heroin epidemic in the suburbs. So if we can get those groups, the, the church groups, both in the cities and in the suburbs, to take that message to the public, and quite frankly, some of them already know because it's happening in their homes. Then, then I think we will have transcended that political um, albatross or potential political albatross. Often it's, it's uh, bluntly put quieter in the suburbs because they go and buy the stuff in the lower income neighborhoods and the crime then and the related violence that comes from it is in the lower income neighborhoods and often the parents in the suburbs are too busy to be in denial, they don't want to be embarrassed, and uh, yet it, it's kind of an interesting thing because trying to get that public is a whole nother uh, task that we face. Any other closing comments? Uh, anything we said here today, Dr. Maybe McCoy? just one because we've gotten off a, a little bit, which is I don't think anybody here is saying fund. Can you move the mic over so we can? I don't okay. think anyone here is saying fund more of what we've got take the opportunity to use measurement and to, to take the things that you know you want to buy and link those two together. And then I, th I agree that that's going to knock your political albatross off your neck. Any other co closing comments? I think, Congressman Souter, and when you asked about the faith-based communities, what we have used is the potential of collaboration, because there is a great deal of stigma involved as, as um, Judge Wilson was saying, and, and to, become, to begin to get the faith-based community involved, we do mentoring programs with them. We ask them to hold NA and NAA meetings in their churches. They do parties in our women and children's programs. And that begins to invest them in the process that, as, as Dr. Jaffe was saying, this is an equal opportunity destroyer. It does not matter who you are. And you know, especially with, with our programs in Baltimore, we are effectively using the faith-based community there um, to really be our partners. They don't want to be doing drug treatment. 
th there is really a myth that, you know, the pastor in your church is going to, you know, to heal you. Would, wouldn't it be great if it were that easy? Right. Well, I, I want to make sure that, that we have on the record, it's an equal opportunity, in other words, in the sense of people using drugs, but there is no question that the violence is not equally spread, that the dealing is not equally spread, that the impact on employment in groups that are already high at risk get it added to it, that when we're doing the returning offenders program in Allen County, the bulk of them are going into the lowest income, highest, uh, poorest housing areas uh, in Fort Wayne and Allen County where they already aren't jobs, and where the people are moving out of some of the school systems because uh, drugs are in every school, as is evidence in our highest uh, uh, what our highest income school were uh, in the county has a probably a biggest drug dealing problem but there are more students they don't have the shootings in the school there are for whatever reasons uh, probably a higher percentage of uh, parental involvement in the school more income a different different types of things and it just is I mean I can go I can go into an urban school in Fort Wayne and say how many of you have heard a shooting and I'll see 75% a shooting other than a hunting for a deer uh, in Indiana, I have to cover it that way. 75% will say yes. I can go into uh, uh, Homestead or Carroll or other schools that are in the suburbs or a rural school and get none to 10%. There, there is a difference on the impact of it, even though it is an equal opportunity destroyer and most drug users in America are white. Um, that uh, uh, just like everything else, but it, it has a disproportionate impact because the families may not have the health insurance, they may not have the support group around them, they might have the tradition or connections to get a job, so there is a disproportionate negative impact, which is what we at the federal government have to be looking at. Uh, a lot of the other problems are state and local. One last question I forgot I wanted to ask this. Why, if the programs aren't effective, um, hasn't the market in health insurance or the people who pay the insurance made some adjustment. In other words, why would they want to pay two or three times to send somebody through a program if a program that lasted just a little bit longer would have had more success? Why hasn't the market adjusted? The problem is so big, Congressman Souter. I mean, I'll use our District of Columbia facility for you. All of our clients come from CSOSA. They are federally mandated from prison. They are putting our clients through a 28-day program. We're talking. I'm a man right now. He's 82 years old. He's been shooting heroin since he was 13, and he's in a 28-day program. I couldn't change one of my bad behaviors in 28 days, much less shooting dope in my neck since I was 13. I understand. But the problem's so big. Okay, now let's take that. If this was a private sector, you have private people paid for with private insurance? Very, all... very little private okay. pay. What, are most people in drug treatment in private pay in America? No. Most are no longer under if private If you had pay. a problem, Congressman, you know, Father Martin's Ashley and Havre de Grasse would probably be a very effective yeah, well, program. That's what I didn't understand. Would you say 80% at this point is public pay? Uh, oh. 38%, I think, in 1977. Will, is, was that the number? It's, it's in our report. 38%, okay. I think, is private sector, and about 62% is now public sector, with the bulk of that coming from the federal government okay, well directly that's really or indirectly. Medicaid or block grant. Mm -hmm. yes. block grant. Well, th thank you very much for your testimony today. It's been very important as we mo move through drug treatment and appreciate your cooperation. And with that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice testifies before the September 11th Commission. Live coverage begins Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN.